You're watching a message from Dr. Jim Dixon, founding senior pastor of Cherry Hills Community Church. Jim studied the scriptures, history, and current events to prepare purposeful and insightful sermons. Enjoy this sermon and be blessed. We are returning this morning to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we're dealing with a passage in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is focusing on the subject of love. Our passage is found in Matthew's Gospel, the fifth chapter, beginning with the 43rd verse, so Matthew 5, 43 and following. <clears throat> you have heard it said of old, thou shalt love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father who is in heaven for he makes his son rise on those who are evil and those who are good and he sends rain on the just and the unjust for if you love those who love you what reward have you for do not tax collectors do the same and if you welcome only your brothers and sisters what more have you done than others do not unbelievers do the same you therefore must be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect this ends the reading from God's holy word let's pray together before we have our message this morning <clears throat> Dear Father, by your Holy Spirit, we pray that you would anoint this place, that you would transform us, that you would empower your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> More than seven years ago, on March 2nd, 1994, a Jewish man named Barack Goldstein entered a Palestinian mosque near the tomb of the patriarchs in the village of Hebron, in the nation of Israel. In a murderous rage, he shot and killed 48 Palestinian people. And in the midst of the violence, Barack Goldstein himself was killed. And his funeral was held a week later in the city of Jerusalem <clears throat> and at his funeral at his memorial <clears throat> he was eulogized with words of praise and it was in the context of his funeral that rabbi rabbi the Jewish rabbi Yaakov Perin made his incredible statement, his infamous statement. The lives of a million Arabs are not equal to the value of one Jewish fingernail. That same week, in the same city, the city of Jerusalem, a memorial was held for the 48 Palestinians who died. And their families and loved ones came in the midst of rage and great sorrow with an incomprehensible sense of loss. And it was in the context of that memorial service that the PLO leader, Khalil Aziz, gave a prayer. And that prayer should be equally infamous for Khalil Aziz prayed, God, 
Help us to murder every Jew one by one until they are gone from the face of the earth. Now, if you've been reading your newspapers recently <clears throat> or watching the international news, you know that the hatred continues. The hatred continues in Israel and in the Middle East. And a brief glimpse of history shows us that there has always been hatred for one's enemies. It would be nice if we could look back on history and be able to conclude that Christians were innocent with regard to the hatred of enemies, but that would not be the case. As we look at history, we see that Christians have also hated their enemies. This morning, God would remind us of the Crusades when in the name of Christ and under the banner of Christ, Christians marched in hatred, perpetrating atrocities, some of them actually butchering Hebrew and Muslim women and children. This morning, God would remind us of the Inquisition, when in the name of Christ, the Church of Christ participated in ethnic cleansing, seeking to eradicate Jewish people from sections of Europe through deportation and genocide. And yet, as Christians, we also want to remember the good things that those before us have done. The hospitals that Christians have established all over the world. The schools, the churches. The loving e effort that has been made by many Christians to minister to people, body, mind, and soul. And of course, this morning as we gather here as Christians, Christ would remind us that we in our generation and in our time are called to be people of love. We focus on love this morning, not hate. And the call of Christ upon his people is the call of love. The charge of Christ is the charge to love. And I have two teachings this morning, and the first teaching is this. Love is meant to be the distinguishing mark of the Christian. In my life as a Christian, the distinguishing mark is meant to be love. In your life as a Christian, the distinguishing characteristic of your life should be love. This is what should distinguish us from the world. Jesus said, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The Bible says God is love. The Apostle Paul tells us that the entire law, the entire Torah, is summed up in love. Jesus said this is the first and greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And the second commandment is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. It's all about love. But Jesus wants us to understand the type of love he's called us to. And it's different than the world's concept of love. You see, in the Greek language, there were many words for love. The Greek language is highly specific, more so than English. And one of the Greek words for love is the word eros, which refers to romantic love, love between the sexes. Falling in love is eros. Making love is eros. And another Greek word for love is the word storge. This word storge is also rendered by our English word love, but it refers to family love, the love that parents have for children, the love that children have for parents, sibling love, the love that brothers and sisters have for each other. 
Then another Greek word for love is the word philia. This is also rendered by our English word love, but philia refers to friendship love. Love amongst friends. The affection that friends feel for one another, love that is reciprocal. And these were the three primary Greek words for love. But the problem is that these words do not represent great virtue. Anyone in the world is capable of these three types of love. And as Jesus tells us in this passage of Scripture for today, even the unbelieving, even the tax collectors, everyone's capable of these three kinds of love. Everyone can love those who love them. Even criminals have friends, and they may be loyal to their friends. Even criminals have families, and they may love their families. Even criminals experience romantic love and have sexual desires. There's no great virtue in eros, philia, or storge. I mean, they are, they are good and they are part of life on earth, but there's no great virtue in them. You see, Christ has called his people to a higher standard of love. And so we have this fourth Greek word, agape. And the word agape in the noun form was non-existent prior to Christ. It was not used prior to the Christian era. And in the verb form, it was rarely used. It was non-specific. But you see, the Christian community took this word agape over and they used it to describe Christian love, divine love, the love that Christ has called his people to. And it is a love that is represented in an unconquerable benevolence. It's a love that can't be conquered. And it's benevolent towards all. It's a love that seeks to bless all people. It's a love that seeks to benefit all people, even one's enemies. And this is the call of Christ upon us. We love our enemies. We don't have to like our enemies, but we have to love them. And that means we seek to bless them. That means we seek to benefit them. And this is the call of Christ upon all of us. And how are we doing? I don't know about you, but I oftentimes fall short. You know, uh, Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. He told the story of the Good Samaritan because he wanted us to understand Christian love. And of course, the Samaritans and the Jews, you know, they hated each other. Because the Samaritans were descended from Jews who intermarried with Assyrians during the siege of Assyria upon the northern kingdom. They intermarried producing offspring of mixed blood. And then, according to the Jews, they corrupted the Jewish faith so that they were heretics and half-breeds. And the Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Bible says, had no dealings with Samaritans. And the Samaritans hated the Jews and had no dealings with the Jews. So when Jesus told the story of the good Samaritan who came to the aid of a wounded Jew, the message was clear. Love means you love your enemies. You reach out and seek to help and bless even your enemies. That's the call of Christ upon the Christian community. In the year 1890, a man named John Forney created a brass ring that he mass marketed all over America and all over the world. And the great thing about this brass ring created by John Forney in 1890 was it was inexpensive and it looked just like gold. So everybody wanted to buy it. They wanted to buy it because it was cheap. And they wanted to buy it because it looked expensive. And they were called Fournay rings. 
They became so popular that eventually, as we approach the turn of the century in the year 1900, the word fornay began to refer to anything that was bogus, anything that was kind of imitation, anything that, that was counterfeit, was fornay. Anything that was pretense was fornay. And etymologists tell us that the word phony comes from the word fornay. And I think it is true, surely, in the sight of Christ that many of his people are phony. And I know there's times in my life when I'm phony, when I don't love as Christians are called, when I do not love as a Christian's called to love. That might be true of you too. And yet love is meant to be the distinguishing mark of the Christian on earth. But we shouldn't become too discouraged because there's a second teaching. And the second teaching is this, love is the pathway to maturity. It is, it is the path that leads us to maturity. And we look at the last verse in our passage of scripture for today and Jesus says you therefore must be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect and the Greek word for perfect is the word teleos and perfect is an unfortunate rendering of the Greek word teleos because the word teleos rarely meant perfect what it means is mature it means mature sometimes it means complete but it was used to describe a, a baby as the baby grows and through the years eventually reaches the fullness of its growth so that it becomes an adult. And the, and the child has reached the fullness of his or her height and size. The child is then called teleos, mature, complete. And you see, Christ is saying that he knows we are in process. He knows we are in process and we are in a, on a journey to maturity. And with regard to love and agape love and this divine love that we're called to manifest on earth, he knows we are in process, but we are to seek maturity. We are to seek completeness in Christ. And is that true of us? I mean, are we really seeking to love as he has loved us? Are we really seeking to love and the way he has called us to love. And we do this every day. I mean, do we wake up each day thinking, I, I need to choose to love? Because you see, the biblical word for Christian love, this word agape is, is rooted in your volition. It's rooted in the mind, not the heart. The other forms of love, eros, philia, storge, they are rooted in emotion and feeling, but agape love is a decision. You can choose to love with Christian love. It may involve emotion, but it is a choice. A choice to seek to bless and benefit another person. And you can wake each day and make that choice. You can wake up each morning and make the choice to love as a follower of Jesus Christ and to seek to bless and benefit even your enemies. Well, in the year 1595, in the time of William Shakespeare, in the region of Norfolk, England, a wealthy man was dying. And his wife had died just a few years earlier in childbirth, giving birth to their third child. And now he was dying, and he was very concerned for the three children because they were very little, very young. In his will, he stipulated that all of his wealth was to go to his three children. He also stipulated in his will that his three children were to be given into the care of their uncle, his brother. And then he further stipulated in his will that if by some remote possibility the three children were all to die before reaching maturity, all of the wealth would pass to his brother. But he didn't really know his brother that well, and he didn't know that his brother, deep in his heart, had great greed and envy and jealousy. And he longed to have that wealth. 
And as time passed, he began to want the three children to die so the wealth would come to him. And one day, the uncle, the brother, decided that he would take these three kids, his nephews and nieces, he would take them out into the woods, far out into the woods. And there was a cliff there he knew about, and he would push them off the cliff. When he came to the precipice to push those kids over the cliff that he might gain the, the wealth of his brother, he couldn't do it. I mean, he was evil, but he wasn't that evil. He couldn't just push the kids over the cliff, and so he resolved that he would leave them there in the woods. And he thought, they'll never get out of the woods. We've traveled so far. The woods are so vast. The children are so young. They'll never get out. I'll abandon them. I'll get home. I'll receive the money. And he did this. And indeed, tragically, the kids never made it out of the woods. They all died in the woods. Their bodies were found in subsequent days. And this man inherited all the wealth. But from that story in 1595, there came an expression that became common. And the expression is babes in the woods. And if you're middle-aged or if you're older, You've probably heard that expression. Perhaps you've used that expression, mere babes in the woods. And the idea behind that expression is not simply that someone is young, but their youth is dangerous. I mean, it's dangerous to be mere babes in the woods. And you see, Christ wants his people to understand that if you remain mere babes in the woods, it's dangerous. If you don't grow in maturity, if you don't seek this path of love, if you don't seek to grow in love, it's dangerous. It's dangerous to your soul. And I, I want you to understand before we come to this table this morning how dangerous it is to choose to not grow in love. Dangerous choice. It's dangerous, first of all, because if you don't grow in your love for God, you won't grow in obedience. If I don't grow in my love for God, I won't grow in obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, if you love me. And to the extent we love him, we obey him. Did you know that in the Korean War, there are many soldiers who were not stationed in Korea, many American soldiers. Some American soldiers were actually stationed in Japan, some in some of the other Pacific Islands. And when an American soldier was on leave or when an American soldier left the base, it, there was great temptation. Great temptation because many Asian women during the Korean War were willing to go to bed with American soldiers because they wanted to elevate, if only for a brief period of time, their lifestyle. Now, many American soldiers were married, and yet the temptation was there, and it was all around them, and it was real. Those American soldiers, it is a fact of history, who gave into that temptation and went to bed, those married American soldiers, who gave into that temptation and went to bed with Asian women, were called broken arrows. That's what they were called during the Korean War. They were called broken arrows. And those American soldiers who remained faithful to their wives back home were called straight arrows. What was the difference? What makes a person a straight arrow? Is it not love? At least that is one of the great sources of inspiration for a straight arrow. Love. Love of God, love of one's wife, love of one's spouse. It's love. If you want to be faithful to God, because the Church of Christ is married to Christ, you want to be faithful to Christ, you need to grow in your love. I mean spending time with Him every day in the Word and in prayer. That means fellowshipping with other Christians. Seeking to kindle the spark of love that you had when you first received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. 
It's a dangerous thing not to grow in love. It's also dangerous not to grow in love because if we don't grow in love and if we don't move towards maturity in love, there'll be no power to our ministry in this world. See, ministry, Christian ministry is empowered by love. That's what enables Christian ministry in this world. If you want to have a ministry for Christ in your neighborhood or at work or with your children or anywhere, then you must learn love because by the power of the Holy Spirit, love enables ministry. I'll tell you a little story it took place in my life a little less than 27 years ago. I was at the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles in Aurora. And I'd, Barb and I had just come to Colorado. We'd, we'd moved here a little over a year before that. And uh, I'd been pulled over by a cop because I'd run, a re I'd run through a stop sign. And when he asked for my license, he saw that I had a California license. He asked me how long I'd been in Colorado. I told him over a year. And he gave me a mercy period of time uh, where I could get a Colorado license. And I had waited until the last day of that mercy period. And there I was at the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles in Aurora, and I was in a bad mood. And I, and I don't fully remember why now, I'm sure there was a complexity of reasons, but I was in a bad mood. I was kind of irritated, I didn't want to be there. And I got there and it was a big crowd and a long line. And not only had to take the written test, but I had to take the driver's test. And they told me I just might as well wait for a period of time. There was a whole bunch of chairs set up, and, uh, you know, most of the chairs were empty. I, I went to a, I didn't want to talk to anybody. I went to a section of chairs where I was as far away from everybody as I could possibly be, and I sat down in a chair. I just didn't want to talk to anybody. Well, there, there came a guy that, uh, you know, uh, also needed to get his license, and he was also told to wait, and... He could have chosen any chair, and, but for some reason, this guy came and sat in one of the chairs that was right next to me. I mean, he invaded my space. He just came and sat right next to me. And there was countless chairs, but he sat right next to me and he wanted to talk. And he was really friendly. I mean, I wasn't friendly. I wasn't even nice, but he was really friendly. And he wanted to talk about the whole situation, how there's always a line here, and he began to tell me about the car he drove and what kind of a car do I drive. And I was kind of being rude. I mean, not blatantly, but I, I was just giving real short answers, and I wasn't saying much, and I really didn't want to talk to him. Well, finally, he turns to me and he says, uh, what do you do? <laughs> and at that time, I was a minister at Faith Presbyterian Church in Aurora. And I, and I told him that. And he said, you're a minister. He said, what, what type of a minister? And I, I said, well, I'm <laughs> a rude, a rude minister. No, I said, <laughs> I, said uh, I said, I'm a Christian minister. And he didn't say anything for a second. He just paused and, he, and then he said, you know, this is amazing. I was just telling my wife this morning that... Uh, I'm really interested in Christianity, and I think I would like to become a Christian, but I don't know how. And in an amazing moment, and by an amazing act of God, and by his incomprehensible mercy and grace, I was able to lead this young man to saving faith in Jesus Christ. But I can look back on 28 years in the ministry, and I can tell you that's the only time that's the only time anything like that has ever happened when I wasn't loving. I mean, it just doesn't normally work that way. I mean, God's all-powerful, as he demonstrated that day, and God can do anything. But I want you to know, and he wants you to know, it doesn't normally work like that. Normally, when you're rude, you have no ministry. And when you're not loving, you have no ministry. That's the way it normally works. And through the years, I've learned that. And Christ tells us that. And it's so dangerous if we don't learn to love. It's so dangerous if we don't grow in love because we don't bear fruit in this world. 
Love empowers ministry. And finally, it's dangerous if we don't grow in love because we invite the judgment of God. You see, the church at Ephesus, if you read the letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, you notice that the church at Ephesus received the judgment of Christ because it had abandoned its first love. Dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing. You know, I think a lot of Christians are in the doldrums. You know what the doldrums are? I mean, there's in the oceans of this world, north of the equator, there are vast sections called the doldrums where there's very little wind, very little breeze. In the days of sailing vessels, these ships always avoided the doldrums because they would become stagnant there and they would sometimes sit there for weeks because there's no breeze. The doldrums. And, and I think sometimes in my life and surely sometimes in your life, you experience the doldrums in your spiritual life. And you want to feel the breeze the freshening, the quickening of the Holy Spirit again. Did you know the word in the Bible for spirit is in the Greek language pneuma and in the Hebrew language ruah, and these words also mean breeze or wind. And I think that we all need to pray for the Holy Spirit to breathe on us, to blow a quickening wind upon us and to fill us and anoint us and bring us out of the doldrums again. And I know in Christ that it's part of my call as a pastor to seek to bring us out of the doldrums. I'm reminded of what the Apostle Peter wrote in the second letter, the first chapter of Second Peter, when he writes, uh, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue your virtue with knowledge, your knowledge with self-control, your self-control with steadfastness, your steadfastness with godliness, your godliness with brotherly affection, and your brotherly affection with love. If these things are yours and abound, they will keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in your knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Whoever lacks these things, whoever lacks this growth, is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his sins. And he goes on to say, I intend always to remind you of these things, though you know them. But I think it right, as long as I'm in this body, to rouse you by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body is soon. See, that's the call of a pastor, to rouse by way of reminder. And... I think a lot of times people come to church to be comforted, and that's important, and we all need comfort. But sometimes we need to be roused. And Christ wants to rouse us to love. That's what he wants to do today as we come to this table. He wants us to be people who are distinguished by our love, that that's our distinguishing mark. And he wants us to understand that love is the path to maturity and that it's dangerous not to walk that path and not to seek growth. And we won't grow in our obedience if we don't grow in our love for God. We won't have ministry in this world. We won't bear fruit in our communities if we don't have love for people. And if we don't love, we invite the judgment of God. Let's have a word of prayer before we come to the communion table. Lord Jesus, we absolutely marvel at your love. And Lord, while we were yet sinners, you died for us. You demonstrated what it means to love your enemies and what agape love means. We marvel, Lord Jesus, that uh, in your love, you let, left the comfort of heaven and you came to earth and you were born in that little manger in Bethlehem. It was because of love that you took our flesh upon yourself shared our humanity and it was love that led you to the cross as we come to this table lord we remember your body broken and your blood shed we remember your love and we know that you have given us an example 
that we should follow in your steps, and we pray that you would find us faithful. And this day, by your Holy Spirit, you would bring us out of the doldrums, Lord, and that every day from this day forth, we would seek, we would will to love. We pray these things, Lord Jesus, in your great and matchless name. Amen.